is Monday, July 25th. I apologize for the delay. Technically, we're seven minutes early from our normal show time, but Chris and I talked about it. We're going to start going at noon every day. I hope that doesn't screw everybody up, but as we get into football season, we want to have a little more time in case we want to go longer than an hour and, and, and all the post-production stuff. It just needs to come 30 minutes earlier, so we're going to start kicking off the show at noon. Today was supposed to be the, the first day. I'm over here sweating, like freezing <laughs> hard. I'm in here. Like, long story short, I have this $2,000 camera that I yeah. use in studio, right? Well, I took it to my daughter's softball tournament this weekend and then left the camera bag in our car and uh, my daughter was getting dropped off somewhere. So it was just frantic trying to get it back. So I'm going to take a deep breath, but uh, <laughs> excited for today's show. A lot to talk about Tennessee volunteers. The Jeremy Pruitt scandal is cut. Details are coming out and it is fucking nuts. I mean, wife giving cash to people. I mean, the list of people that are indicted on this is, is insane and they will never work in college sports again. None of them. So we're going to talk about that. Going to talk about training camp because coaches are back in the office. Like the Ohio State coaches are back in the office today, getting back after it, getting ready for training camp and gearing up for college football season. So if that doesn't make you excited, I don't know what will. These coaches are no longer on vacation. They are ramped back up at the Woody Hayes, getting with their players, working with them, and getting them prepared for the 2022 college football season. Welcome. To, <laughs> uh, thank God you're back. But if you missed it last week, Thursday, Friday, we had a little challenge here on Menace to Sports, our Menace Army. I threw out, someone said in the chat, hey, Chris, how much to shave an eyebrow? And he said 500. And guess what? That super chat got to 600. So, Chris, show them your beautiful missing eyebrow. Yeah, no, I, I got you. It's bad. It looks crazy, man. I got the Cleveland Music Awards coming up. That thing is gone, bro. And I had to wear this hat at work because, like, I'm a, I'm a boss of some people, and I can't have people looking at my face laughing at me. <laughs> but but there you have it. I took it off. It's uh, it looks it's it looks it looks garbage. I look like a <laughs> dummy, bro. I shaved it, bro. And my mom walked in the bathroom and she was like, "What did you just do? What did you just do?" Because I had to go find my my razor because my my mom just moved to new houses, so I'm like going through boxes and like throwing all this stuff all over the place looking for this damn razor. And then we uh we, we took we took one shave, but I feel like a tough guy, man. Cause like now I got the beanie on in the middle of summer, 95 degrees outside. Got the beanie looking on in the stupid, looking like a hipster, <laughs> and the, looking like and, some hipster. You got puka puka shell necklace on too, or what? What else are you rocking? <laughs> and, and and a band aid, bro. People think I people at work think I fought somebody. I'm the only black person that works here, so like it, you know they think I'm a real tough guy. Um, <laughs> now you're just playing into all the stereotypes. Yeah, a beanie in the summer. What the yeah, hell? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm the mean boss, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, but look, Zach, your stupid talk worked. That whole, the only thing we have in this world is our word, blah, 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 blah. Congrats. Hey, I said, you got to look in the mirror. And if you mm -hmm. can look at yourself and say, I'm a coward, then that's fine. <laughs> well, you know, everyone's different and life's full of decisions. God gave you free will, right? Mm -hmm. Well, glad I you do. I do want you to know, it is very, I want everybody to know, it is very cold in the radio station because I got to keep the equipment cool. So from, from, yeah. over, from overheating. So I'm not sweating too much. It's really just when I go outside. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you're comfortable at work. But uh, I, I'm, I'm proud of you, Chris. You are a man of your word. Mm -hmm. You have integrity and you did. You followed through right now. The, the menace army knows if you throw something out there that you're going to follow through and that you just I'm, the next the next challenge that you come up with. Um, people will not hesitate to donate because mm -hmm. they know that you'll follow through. So we appreciate it. Let's talk about Tennessee, Chris. Wild. Stuff it's coming insane. out in the news about Jeremy Pruitt, his wife, Casey, all of his defensive assistants, his entire recruiting staff. Give me the rundown. So basically what this was, was first of all, somebody snitched, somebody flipped. And they had this system. They were giving cash to, to, to recruits and players. Um, they were giving gifts for like car payments. They were giving furniture. It was, it was a whole system, Zach. And Tennessee went down for it. And somebody snitched and flipped and made sure that all the people involved will never work in college athletics again. Like, well, here, here's the question. Done. So here's the question I have, and I'm going to throw it up there. Did Jeremy Pruitt just decide to be a scumbag cheating coach? Mm -hmm. Like, make that decision that that was the only way to succeed after learning for from and working for Jimbo Fisher at Florida State. He was de his defensive coordinator. Kirby Smart at Georgia, his defensive coordinator. And Nick Saban at Alabama, his defensive coordinator. So did, did he not learn enough? from those three uberly successful head coaches 
on how to build a program without cheating? Or here's the question for you. Did he learn these tactics from Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, and Jimbo Fisher? That's the question in the comments. I want to know, did he learn it from those three? Are those three doing this shady shit? And if so, how are they not getting caught? And exactly. how did he get caught? As you said, who snitched? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, who, who, who let the cat out the bag? But if you look at this, it's crazy. Casey Pruitt, his wife, made 25 payments of $500 cash for a total of $12,500 to a recruit. Also paid $3,000 in rent pay payments for a player and his mom. Then Drew Hughes, former director of player personnel, Jacksonville Jaguars' current player personnel guy, gave thousands of dollars in cash, hotel stays, meals, entertainment, transportation, game day parking, and team apparel to recruits. I mean, they were threading these kids up. Yes. Giving them handicapped parking spots, basically, at, at, at games. They were giving them cash. I mean, this is the probably the wildest story we've had since Miami was, was given blow and hookers to recruits. I mean, this is just <laughs> – this is another level of a recruiting violation. There's – you know, there's times where you let a kid get some gloves or you let a kid get a hat, right? Yeah. Or, or, you you know, whatever it is. Like, a little thing here or there. That happens in recruiting sometimes. It just does. Right. Players give recruits gloves and then they walk out with block O gloves like that happens. That is technically illegal, but it's so minuscule that no one really bats an eye. This is monstrous. I mean, this you is go down. 18, 18 level one recruiting violation, Zach. That it's, isn't it. That is massive in the past. Massive. Like it was a big deal when LSU had eight. They had 18. They were hosting big recruiting visit weekends at Tennessee during the dead period. Giving twelve thousand, I mean, spending twelve thousand dollars on kids during the dead period, where you're not supposed to have right. any contact with recruits. Like this is a, it was a blatant fuck you to NCAA. But, but I am curious because, like, first of all, somebody snitched, somebody was upset, and this got yeah. out. And, and like you kind of alluded to before, you don't just do this. He learned this from someone and thought he could get away with this from someone. But again, eight, like, like you talk about coaches committing NCAA violations all the time. Like it happens. It's a part of the game. But, but to little. commit they're, eighteen they're little. tier one. Yeah, they're little bending rules or maybe, you know, just do, going a little too far. But this is nuts. I mean, this is – and the, the penalty is going to be outrageous. What, mm -hmm. what Tennessee And Tennessee, you know, to their credit, the minute they found out, they chopped the head off. They fired all of them. And so that's going to be their – I guess their, their ploy to not have massive violations on their program. But it was their entire defensive staff. And Jeremy Pruitt is a defensive coordinator. He's a defensive coach, so all of his defensive coaches – those were handpicked. That was his crew. That was his, those were his guys, right? You look at Urban Meyer. When Urban Meyer hired a staff, he always hired his guys on offense. And then he had to figure out what coaches to hire on defense because he didn't have guys, right? He didn't work with guys intimately in a defensive meeting room. Kurt, uh, Jeremy Pruitt worked with these guys. He knew these guys very well. Brian Niedermeyer, their inside linebackers coach, who now is the defensive coordinator at IMG Academy, by the way. Look mm -hmm. at that. My favorite school, IMG. Brian Niedermeyer, same thing. He, 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 the, all of them did thousands of dollars in cash, hotel stays, meals, entertainment, transportation, game day parking, and team apparel to recruits. Derek Ansley was their defensive coordinator. Jeremy Pruitt's hand picked defensive coordinator. Same shit as, as the other coaches. He did it with nine players uh, that, that enrolled at Tennessee. Six of them played in games. So you're talking about now the NCAA has to say, all right, they cheated to get. He, he cheated to get nine players. Six of yeah. them played in games. So now it impacted games and impacted the program. It was a, The cheating was a direct result. The direct result of the cheating it was wins. these kids coming to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Shelton Felton, the Vol outside linebacker coach, who's now the head coach at Valdosta High School in Georgia. Same shit. Nine, nine enrollees. Six of them played. And then the two recruiting girls, Bethany Gunn, uh, same shit, but she also bought furniture and household items for recruits. <laughs> and the big thing is they lied to investigators. That is when you're done. That mm -hmm. is when, when you lie to investigators and they have proof. When they ask you a question, when the NCAA comes in, they ask you a question. They already have the answer. There's no need to lie. When they say, did you buy furniture for, for XYZ? They have they the already receipt. know. Mm -hmm. They know. They're not asking a question to find out. They're asking a question to see if you'll just come clean and make it easier. And if you lie, you're fucked. You're fucked. That's why you're supposed to give non-answer answers. But I mean, if, if you if you look at the last like couple stops before he was the head coach, you already alluded to it. I mean, he was at Florida State in 2013. Then he was at Georgia, and then he was with Bama. He pulled from those three coaches. Now the it, question is, who flipped? Who well, who snitched? I, I would imagine it was it was someone 
that obviously didn't operate like that and found out about it. And they're like, this is bullshit. Like we have mm -hmm. proof now, like this is going on. Uh, but you know, we'll never know who that was never because that, that coach will never be named even. I mean, there's an unnamed UT donor that, yeah. that is implicated in this, but they won't name the donor. So you look at, I mean, Tennessee, they're, they're going to have to disassociate from a big time donor who was donating money to get all this stuff done. And then a, an unnamed student recruiting assistant, which I'm glad that they didn't name it just a student assistant because that kid, if Jeremy Pruitt told him to do something, to do I mean, something, he's, just, you do it. he's a young kid doing what he's supposed to do. I'm glad. I'm really glad they, they didn't, uh, didn't name him, but I mean, it, it's just, I don't know. This is just it, wild. It, it runs really deep. And now Tennessee and the people that were named in this report have 90 days to respond. Yeah. Um, and, so I think they're going to see what what punishment they give themselves. And then obviously they'll tack onto it. So if you're Tennessee, what do you do? Like, do, are they going to be ineligible for bowl games? And how's that going to hurt their recruiting currently? Is it fair to the current kids on the roster that aren't those you know, nine kids. Well, of course not, but that's not how it works, right? It is always unfair to the kids that weren't involved, the coaches that weren't involved. It, it, they're they're going to, they'll do stupid things like take away wins, which that does nothing. Who cares? Right. But when they, imp, imp, you know, implement bowl bans, the kids, the, the coaches that did, they did all the bad stuff. They're gone. So they're not getting penalized for that. Now they'll have a show cause for these coaches. They won't be allowed to coach in the NCAA. Maybe ever. It might be indefinite. Mm -hmm. Um, so they, you know, like one coach is at the San Diego chargers and, and then one's in high school, two are in high school. So these coaches know, like my college career is over. Like it yeah. is officially over. They'll never coach again, but it goes back to a story I used to tell when North Carolina was getting, I guess, investigated for their academic scandal, big academic scandal at North Carolina. One assistant coach that I know when the NCAA came in, his lawyer told him, listen, you don't answer a question. You just don't, you, you cannot answer a question. Don't lie. Don't tell the truth. Don't answer it. But you have to, you have to say something. So just say bizarre things. And so they'd ask him like, were you aware that this tutor was writing papers for these athletes? And his answer would be like, what? I don't even like pizza. <laughs> and they were like, huh? And then they'd be like, well, were you aware that this tutor was doing this schoolwork for these kids? And he'd be like, chocolate is my favorite. So he's and not lying. Like, yeah. He's not lying. He's answering the question. And at the end of it, it's like, well, after about five minutes, he was like, they, they basically just like, this is fucking pointless. And they got up and his interview was over. And now he can't get implicated for lying. He gave absolutely no information. He has no part of this investigation anymore, unless someone else tells him that he was involved. Right. So it's, uh, you, you absolutely have to lawyer up and you, you just don't, you, mm -hmm. you can't give them anything truth or lie. You just can't. Now I want to know where where Pruitt went wrong here. Did he did he do too much too quickly? Was it the hosting all those kids on like like what did he do that went too far? Because you and I talked a little bit before the show, and I felt like you know this is something that might be happening in other SEC schools, but it does sound crazy. And you told me this is the craziest kind of recruiting subworld you've heard at one university. Well, it's it's not crazy that it went on, but it's crazy that all this stuff is coming out, and they mm -hmm. they just. I mean, I, like they know it all. Like as, some somebody really was double agenting. Like they know it's all almost as, like the only thing that would make it worse is if they were emailing each other about it, creating a paper trail and turning in receipts to get reimbursed. Like that's the only way this could get worse because th they were doing outlandish things to cheat and recruiting. And at mm -hmm. the same time, that stuff goes on everywhere in the South. And right. so they it's not like Jeremy Pruitt just made up this game. It's not like he decided that to compete with Alabama, he had to cheat because Nick Saban's doing it squeaky clean. and. You know, he just decided to be a shitbag. He learned this stuff. The problem is his wife was doing it. Like, yeah, his that feels way too close. That it. feels silly that it's that close. In the South, it is booster direct. It's direct deposit. Boosters <laughs> through churches to recruits, right? It is never the, the coach gets 10 grand in cash and hands it to recruits. It's just, I mean, if you want to get caught, my God, nowadays with camera phones and the way kids talk and social media, all it takes is one kid Screenshot, to get right. three grand. And then he goes somewhere else. He goes to USC and he's telling those coaches like, oh yeah, Tennessee, they just gave me a McDonald's bag with, with three stacks in it. <laughs> and USC is like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Turn them in. Turn them in right away. Turn them in immediately. How do you, all right, I want to throw up Ty's question. And then I do want to uh, to throw up that other one about Ohio State, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Thank you for the super chat, Ty. Ty and, uh, and don't worry, Terry, we're going to get to yours in a sec. How will this impact NIL for Tennessee and go Bucks? Zach, does this 
Does this well, kind of slow Tennessee's momentum, or does it not matter with the new age? The only thing that's going to kill them is, is bowl bands. Kids aren't going to want to play come there, right? Mm -hmm. the, all the money in the world, they're going to go somewhere else for a little less money so they can try to win a national championship. Like every kid wants, almost every kid wants to do that. So bowl bands will kill them. And then scholarship limits, right? Like we had, I think, a, I think it was eight or five uh, scholarship reduction at Ohio State because of Tattoo Gate. And it was brutal because you think about it, Every team, you're missing out on eight kids. If one or two of those is a great player, you're missing out on two impactful players. That's if your hit rate is 25%. And so that's a huge, huge handcuff in recruiting. And what about so, with Texas and, Tech? Texas Tech, they're just they're just using the NIL to create more scholarship spots. Do you think that could be an option in this world? I mean, it could be, but again, the bowl ban will kill them because who wants to go to Tennessee and not be able to play in a playoff when you could go to Georgia or, or Alabama or Ohio state and play for a national championship. Like that's, that's just the reality. And the kid that the kid that's going to go to Tennessee is a lesser version of the kid that would have without the limitations, right. Without the bowl ban. So the NCAA has got, I mean, it's going to be a postseason ban. I don't know how long I would, I would guess three to five years, probably mm -hmm. three sounds about right. And then a scholarship reduction, and then they're, you know, and the, whatever credit they give Tennessee for firing everyone. Not that that's some like amazing feat. Yeah. Like, of course they fired everyone. What other choice did they have? It's not like they tried to keep who no one would try to keep them on. They don't, they shouldn't get that much credit for firing everyone. Well, it's not like they were having a, they were having a dominant run. Like, if they're having a dominant run, maybe it's easier to keep this quiet, or maybe it's easier to, to you know, justify, maybe keep it a coach or harder to fire everybody. Well, and then um, he had a losing come... record. Like, he's yeah, buying exactly. all these players and he had a losing record. It's like, <laughs> man, you fucking stink. Like, you're cheating blatantly in a bad mm -hmm. way and you're awful with yeah. cheating. Like, just an <laughs> unlevel <laughs> playing field and your team sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that, that is terrible. And you know, you know, I feel really, really bad for. I feel really bad for Hendon Hooker if they get a ban because I think Tennessee could have a really good team this year. Well, you like, you know how I feel about Tennessee. I think Tennessee mm -hmm. has a chance to be really good because I guess those cheating those cheated players, those bought players, are now a little older. <laughs> they're going to be veterans, so they're going to be more impactful. So, I mean, it's if they don't get a bowl ban, I mean, this is this is a great day for the current mm -hmm. Tennessee staff. No, I agree. And then I'm also I'm also curious to see what the Nico kid does. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, he's, he's kind of the pro another program changer, cool. very talented quarterback. I think he's better than Arch. I have him as my quarterback one, six, four, you know, athletic can really sling it. He's currently committed to Tennessee, but he wants to win something. Yeah. And, and the, at the end of the day, the real problem here is going to be the NCAA is not fast to do anything. Mm -hmm. And so 90 days to respond. I mean, this process is going to drag out and it's going to come signing day. And it's like, all right, do I really want to risk it? If, if we yeah. haven't heard anything yet, if we haven't got the penalty yet, do, does that kid, does Nico want to risk it? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm that kid, absolutely fucking not. I'm not and, risking it. And I feel bad for Tennessee fans, man. They finally absolutely. have some excitement, and they just get fucking bitch slapped just, by 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 this past regime. That they hate it anyway. Cock like, slapped in the face, just <laughs> awful. Right. So the way this works, Zach. Now, um, now that all this has kind of come forward, the the allegations are there. Um, now they have everyone named in Tennessee has 90 days to reply to respond to this. So basically, mm -hmm. 90 days to lawyer up, get your affairs in order, and figure out what you're gonna do. And then after that three months that they have, then NCAA gives themselves two months to then come back with a final punishment, which is entirely way too much time. Well, way that too much time. five months from today is Christmas. It is mm -hmm. it is July 25th. In five months, it is Christmas. Santa Claus is coming. And by the way, signing day, it's before Santa comes. Signing day happens before Santa comes down the chimney. So these kids that sign are not going to have an answer. No, so they, it's, it's unfortunate for... For Tennessee fans, Tennessee, you know, the program, I mean, obviously it's, what are you going to do? I mean, it went on, like you have to, you have to address it, but it's unfortunate because they, they just had so much momentum. Things were going in the right direction and this is just going to derail everything. I really hope they don't get a postseason ban just because I don't think that that is beneficial at all. Um, I think that all that does no, is. I mean, in my opinion, right. They should suspend the kids that took money for mm -hmm. let's say three games, like give them a suspension. Like, make them pay for it. At the same time, they're kids. Like, they were 18 years old. You know, don't you don't need to go too hard on them. And they need to ban those coaches for life, and they need to sue them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, I, they need to, to, to find those coaches, and they should never be allowed to coach in, in the NCAA. And what else should happen is there should be an agreement between the NC2A and the NFL, if they were halfway competent or organization, that if a coach has a show cause, he, can, he is not allowed to coach in the NCAA. He, sh he should not be allowed to coach in the NFL. Because right now, I think he's with the Giants, or he was last year. 
We, well, the, their one coach, uh, let me see his name. He is with, um, where is he? Derek Ansley. He's the Chargers DB coach. Yeah. I and do the other know. two are in high school football, and I, I think it should carry there. Like, why, if you are that blatant of a cheater, would you want that guy leading kids? And mm -hmm. then now, those two coaches that went to high school, they're on the other side of recruiting. Now NIL's popping. You think they're not going to do shady shit with NIL? They were doing shady shit without it. So it's... That's what should happen. And I, but I agree. They're going to punish everyone that didn't do anything. That's what they're going to do. Because that's yeah. what the NCAA does. They punish people that didn't commit the crime. It'd be like, you go out and rob a bank. I go to jail. It's like, what? <laughs> I didn't even know about it. I wasn't even there. Right. It's like, wait, I was at the crib. I did nothing wrong. I didn't even, I didn't even want to. It's just like, it's like. Well, if, you have this whole staff that's like, we were at UCF doing it the right way. And we get mm -hmm. penalized? Like, what the fuck? Exactly. I mean, it's like, so, so my boss, my former boss at work got in trouble for saying something really racist. And then, and then I got promoted and it would have been like me, you know, suffering through like his punishment, even though yeah, like I didn't had, do it. You had to go to <laughs> racism training because exactly. you said racist shit. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like, come on now. Like, Wait, like what? what are, yeah, exactly. What are we doing? It is, it is ridiculous, but you know what the NCAA tends to do? They tend to fuck this kind of thing up. Oh, yeah. um, well, Jeremy they, Pruitt they just... was they don't have a model, right? They don't, they don't have a model that is, that, that accurately punishes wrongdoers, right? They have this, this flex that they can just kill programs because of something that went on by, by humans and those humans won't even be there. So it, it's just, they're fucked up and the NCAA is yeah. fucked up in every way, sense, way, shape or form. I am super intrigued in now Nico's, Nico's recruitment because obviously other schools are going to be reaching out to him like crazy saying that they're, they're hearing there's going to be a ban, negative recruiting, all that. Um, to me, he's the top quarterback in the country. Ohio State doesn't have a quarterback committed for this class. I wonder if they'll kick tires on him. Oregon was his second option. They got five-star Dante Moore. Um, you know, so guys are going other places. Obviously, Arch is at Texas. So, like, <laughs> because quarterbacks tend to commit early, he committed early, and now all the chips have kind of fallen. So yeah. I am really intrigued to, to see what, what happens with him. I don't think Ohio State's going to get him, but I think now it's a conversation, um, and I think – I don't know. I don't know. Now teams are going to come knocking. So, or does he say, you know what? I'm still making seven figures. Fuck it. Facts. Facts. Seven million dollar deal. Reportedly, rumor. You didn't hear from us. Something like that. Nico to Miami. They have the money, but they also just, you know, went and got a a, a high a highly rated kid. Um. All right, Zach. I want to move forward a little bit. Coaches check in. What are coaches up to this time of the year? Well, like, like I said, they're back in the office. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's really cool because I, I've, you know, run into quite a few of them around Columbus and they are, you know, like Justin Fry was at his lake house with his family in Indiana, like Larry John, everyone is, is enjoying that, that precious quality time. Cause that's all you really get. You get the month of July. That is what you get with your family. And it, you were spending every second of the day with them. And then right about now, that for that last Monday of July, you're back in the office and it is full go. All you're doing every day is you're getting around your players, right? You're working with them on drills and skills and getting them kind of fine tuned, coaching them up, meeting with them, teaching the offense. Like you are getting them prepped for training camp. People all the time think you go into training camp and that's where you start to teach and coach players and start to teach them the offense. You, they got to know the offense walking into training camp or they will never play because you're trying to coach up adjustments, put in new wrinkles. You're trying to install things that you didn't have in the offense during training camp because of skill sets and got how guys are performing. And you can't do that. You can't teach them in, uh, drills and skills and stuff like that in training camp for the first time. I mean, you will do, you will teach them stuff, but you got to start that in the summer. I mean, you, you do it in spring ball, you do it in June. And when you get back the next week and a half before training camp starts, you got to grind with them because you got to get them. It's like preseason. You got to get them prepped for training camp. And so the coaches are in the office, they're meeting, they're going through recruiting, they're, you know, putting together their, their offense. They're, they're literally putting together their playbook. Like this is our offense. This is who we are going to be. We think right. And that, that is subject to change throughout training camp because this kid may be, may just blossom and become mm -hmm. a great player and they want to involve him more and give him a, a little package. So they are prepping all of that. And then they got to prep installs. Like, how are you going to, how are you going to roll all of this out? You can't just go out day one and run every play because they, it, it, you'd be shocked. <laughs> And how detailed the quality control is of practice reps. Like they will put in a concept and they will have an intern tally how many times they ran that concept, how successful was it, what was the issues. And they, as you go, you'll quality control your whole offense because you'll look at it and you say, wow, power. We've only ran power four times in the first week of training camp. So you either got to take that play out or you got to rep it more, right? Yeah. 
And so if you put your whole offense in day one, 80% of it's not getting rep day one. So don't put it in. You got to wait for day two. And then the problem in day two is you put, you know, 15 more percent of your offense in, but are you going to rep any of the stuff from day one? It is such such an algorithm almost, a formula on how to get these plays in and how to start grinding these players to become excellent at those concepts and under fully understand them and execute them at a high level. It's, it's really more complicated than people think people think you just go out and practice football. There is a lot of data on that side of it that coaches use to figure out like, all right, what are we, what, what do we need to do now? Right. The other side of it is if a concept's not very efficient in practice, why would you continue to practice it? And why would you go into a game and run it? It's not been a good play for you. So you have to monitor all of that as you build your offense. That's why training camp is so critical. And that's just developing your offensive scheme. Now you talk about players, Mm -hmm. players going in and performing and what players are going to execute at a high level and, you know, do their job. You don't know right now. No one knows. Now, if it's a kid that started last year and had a great year, then you you assume he's going to be a little bit better version and probably going to be a guy for you. But a kid like Marvin Harrison Jr., you assume he's going to be a great player. Right. I want to st- I want to stay on that. A guy like so shout out to our guy Terry. What should we expect from Paris Johnson? That's another guy that we expect big things from. But Zach, he's only been playing guard, and now we have a new face at offensive line coach, and now potentially a new left or right tackle. Zach, what is that going to be like for him transitioning, like learning the coaching style? And what are those first couple meetings with a guy who you have high you have high expectations for, but you don't know yet if they can play? Well, he's 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 seven months into the tra- uh, transformation, right? He mm-hmm. it's not like he's moving he's to tackle for the first game, right? He's been playing tackle now for seven months, and I'm sure Stud repped him a little bit at tackle because he in an, in an emergency, two guys get hurt. Paris was going to slide out to tackle, so he has tackle reps under his belt. But I do think it's important for fans to understand that that is a big transition guard to tackle, and he's going to face a different intensity in games. And so I think Paris is a top you know, a first round draft pick. I I do. I think he's going to be, but if he's not a first round draft pick game one, fans need to understand he's making a pretty big transition here. And it doesn't matter if he is game one, he just needs to become that eventually would love it. If he was dominant, all American, right? You would love it. And he has the skills and and talent to do that. He's got the coach to develop him into that, but there's going to be some growing pains and they might be quick. They might not be that painful, but there's going to be growing pains no matter what. Even if he's the best tackle to ever play the game, he's going to have some bad plays. Mm-hmm. The The transition from high school tackle, that's what people are talking about in the comments, from high school tackle to college tackle is is huge, isn't it? Um, oh, my God. I, I like, like just, just in general, that might be one of the toughest I mean, positions. How because... many times have you blocked a guy that looks like even Zach Harrison or Chase mm-hmm. Young or JTT? Like, How many times have you ever blocked a kid that skilled and that explosive and that good of a pass rusher? Never in your life. So I don't care. You And you could have went, maybe you went against one ever that was a college player. That's probably the odds, right? Mm-hmm. If you take a high school tackle, I bet you once in his career, he went against a power five scholarship defense event. One game. So now you're doing it every day in practice, in games. Yeah. So it's a massive jump. That's why linemen don't play early because they have to, I mean, they really have to be fundamental geniuses. They, I mean, flawless fundamentals to try to block some of these generational DNs. And even then Chase Young, you're not blocking them. Yeah. And, and for me, it's like Paris Johnson has 13 or 15 game or four, uh, 13 game weeks to get ready for Will Anderson. It's kind of, cause that's as a fan, I'm, I'm, I'm looking ahead. I'm not on staff, but for me, it's like, Listen, here's the reality. I don't care how good Paris Johnson is. No one's blocking Will Anderson one-on-one. Well, you gotta, you gotta at least slow him down. Oh, you, you, you have to do, you, you have to do your down. part in whatever protection scheme that Kevin Wilson and Justin Fry come up with, but you're going to need chips. You're going to need doubles. You're going to need to slide to them. Like you can't just say, Hey Paris, you need to be such a great player. You're going to block the best defensive end in college football over the last two years. Like that's just not going to happen. And if it does happen, fire the offensive staff because it's like when Joey Bosa ended up on a running back to end the game against Penn state fire him. I mean, that it's just, that's dumb. That is a dumbass coach that would allow that to happen. Yeah, no, no, ab- absolute facts. Zach, I do want to talk about the transition of having – we have a lot of new coaches. Um, and, I, you know, for you, at least, you came in with a, with entire new staff that really you hadn't worked with before. Was it awkward, those first couple practices, kind of as, as the flow goes, or was it kind of plug-and-play because you guys all knew your jobs? 
it's very similar to like a new quarterback or new receivers, right? Mm -hmm. You have to get your chemistry down. Like you have to learn how other guys coach, how you coach, how it meshes, how it blends. And then post-practice, you go watch the film. Like how, how is that chemistry in that, in that meeting room when you're, you know, analyzing the film and breaking it down and discussing it. And, you know, it, it's, t it was always tough for, for new guys because went with me line coaches specifically, because they're not used to a receiver coach that has an opinion on offensive line play. And I always did, <laughs> but I, I was just trying to make the offense better. Right. That's all. And so I would throw out opinions and like stud when he first got there, he'd look at me with side eye, like what the fuck, what the fuck are you talking? Shut up. <laughs> who the fuck are you? Like, who the fuck are you talking about? My guys. That'd be like, and, and he wasn't going to talk about the receivers cause he didn't know shit about it. Right. And, and that's where Justin Fry and I work so well because we were such good friends that I would I would talk to him about it and it would be mostly inquisitive. Like I'm trying to find out. I'm trying to learn also. Right. And he would ask all the time about receiver routes and, and concepts because he didn't want to just be some, you know, blinders on O line coach. He wanted to coordinate one day. He wanted to right. understand offensive football from the X to the Z. Right. And so you have to work through all that in training camp. You have to grind it out and figure out like your your chemistry as a staff and you have to at the end of it you have to be aligned and strong and if you are you're going to accomplish really good things if you aren't which honestly more often than not you don't get there that's where little fractures in the offense mm. happen right that's where little things a crack there's a little leak so it's huge training camp is as huge for a new what's staff. what's a crack or a leak look like like you're talking about like not being able to run the ball for two yards on third and two yeah like little, and it's little just stuff like the game the game plans aren't aren't on point right or even worse you know they're it's hard to lie to players and mm -hmm. be phony so if you aren't completely bought in on what you're doing offensively you have to go in a meeting room and those players have to be bought in or they're not going to execute it well and you're going to suck and so if you're not bought in as a coach, how could you get players to buy in? Buy how, in as well. If you're that full of shit, like I, I didn't meet any, it's, it's impossible in my mm -hmm. opinion to lie and act like this is the greatest shit since sliced bread if you disagree. So you have to hash that shit out as coaches before you get with players so that you all can be on the same page and you all can be, you know, all in before you, you go to the players or else you're done. Zach, on the new coaching front, it's going to be an entire new defensive staff. Knowles is the boss. He's got kind of his crew in there. New faces absolutely everywhere. Um, and you would think, at least I would think, that just about every single spot on the defense is open um, yeah. for, for competition because that, that's what absolutely happens. I mean, that, that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> so, Zach, how do you go into camp? Do you, like, do you have a meeting with your defense or meeting with the room? Hey, every spot is up for grabs. you got to bring it every week. Or do you Absolutely. pull some guys aside and say, hey, you do have a, a, a spot locked in based no, on what we no saw? One, you, you never tell a kid he has a spot. Now, kids know. Mm -hmm. Kids know that when they do. And they know, like, like Cameron, Denzel Brown, Burke. Cameron Brown knows that I'm going to be a fucking starting corner. Now, he's got, now, if he goes out and sucks, he'll, get, he'll lose his job. But he mm -hmm. knows deep in his heart, like, as long as I, do, I handle my shit, I'm going to be a starting corner, right? And so, and, and the other side of this is Larry Johnson is still here. So he walks in a meeting room with kids he recruited, coached, and developed. So there's already a rapport there. There's already right. an opinion. There's already, you know, a history there. Whereas all, all of the other defensive coaches, they walked in and they don't know any of these kids. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity for a kid that maybe wasn't a great player or wasn't playing well to embrace this new coach, buy in, and get himself, find himself on the field. Guys, like some of these linebackers, like Taraja Mitchell, that hasn't been on the field really. I mean, and he, when he was, he didn't play well. All of a sudden, he's got Jim Knowles walks in and he's like, oh shit, entirely, that guy has no opinion of me right now. He'll right. develop a little bit of an opinion watching last year's games, but understanding the defensive coaches got fired for a reason. But it's it's new it's new life, right? Fresh blood and new life. It's like being reborn. They have an opportunity to be a different player than they were before. So my question, my I'm a big question about the linebacker room, Zach, because obviously, like this is going to be our first camp with with Knowles, um, and, and every spot should be open by my to my estimation. But it seemed like before, like kind of in the spring workouts everybody was kind of saying that Tommy Eichenberg was kind of penciled in for one of those linebacker spots. He's going yeah. to be the dude. He's good. He's ready. His blunders were not on him. They were more on coaching. It felt like he kind of got the easy way out. When we do have, I think, some talented linebackers, like like EA and Trainum, who was the trans who's the transfer coming in. Zach, do you – like, people have described him as an explosive athlete. He can do all the things you want. Um, he moves and understands the game. Did you see that from him on film last year? Or is it not fair to no. judge him? And is it fair to even pencil him in as a starter for week one? I mean, it's all motivation tactic at this point. That kid has to go out and play really well in training camp to win a starting job. But it's it's completely unfair to judge any of those linebackers based on what happened last year. Because they all of them, every one of them, 
except maybe Steel Chambers because he didn't have a history of linebacker. He was just kind of mm -hmm. unleashed and kind of playing backyard football. Most of them played confused and slow. The confusion right. led to the lack of, of, of aggression, explosion, speed. And so to judge Tommy Eichenberg on what we watched on film last year is entirely unfair. Now, he's going to have the white ginger stigma no matter what. <laughs> but, I mean, Pete Warner was a phenomenal athlete. And he was a white guy. So, mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of them. So it's, it's not always the case. It's just less likely that a white ginger is a, is a, you know, a phenomenal athlete. But I think to, to your point, I think Tommy Eichenberg should get all the, like er, as a fan, right. Mm -hmm. As a coach, you got to wipe that slate clean and just say, all right, what are we getting now? Now we're going to coach him differently, develop him differently. What type of player is he now? Who cares what he was before? We know that was all fucked up. And so all the, all the contacts that I have in the Woody Hayes have, have been raving about how hard this kid is working, how explosive he looks in the summer conditioning program and all of that. So that is a, that is a check mark, right? Mm -hmm. That is a credit to him. So there should be some excitement around him because the coaches have excitement for him. And we're going to get to see, and, and I'll know halfway through training camp, when I talk to some of those coaches, I'll know what type of player he's going to be. And I can, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. Trudana Mitchell, is it too late for his development? Can they undo never a lot of the late. habits they they taught him? And, it's never and too late. Could he be the perfect Mike for them this year? If Absolutely. The Look at Curtis Grant. Mm -hmm. Curtis Grant didn't play at all until 2014. Couldn't get on the field, was an awful football player. In, tw in 2014, Luke Fickle changed everything he did. He became It was almost like getting a new coach. He became a different coach. And all of a sudden, Curtis Grant was a great middle linebacker, Right. That was his last year. I've told the right. story before. There's a kid named David Nelson at Florida. That kid didn't play until his fifth year, week seven. Mm -hmm. Halfway through the season, he started playing because he became Busted a different player. Right. And guess what? In the SEC championship game and national championship game, David Nelson would caught the touchdown to win both games. Mm -hmm. So it's never too late. That, that switch can go on at any moment. And for Taraja Mitchell, you, we hope that switch is right now. He's got new blood a new coach, and an opportunity to go out and become the linebacker that he was supposed to be out of high school. He was a highly rated kid. He absolutely is a ball of clay that Ohio State fans should be looking at saying, you know what, Taraja might become a great player mm -hmm. under this new regime. I mean, Knowles turned Paul Rodriguez, who was a two-star dual-threat quarterback at Oklahoma State, into an All-American, Zach. I, can't, I don't even remember the last time we had an All-American. Um, He's I, a wizard. I, no, he definitely better be a wizard with the way they're missing on the recruiting trail on defense. <laughs> um, I do want to throw this question up here. Zach, who are our studs on D this season, if you had to guess right now? Um, I just, uh, I think it's hard. When Josh, when Josh Proctor's healthy, I think he's going to be one of the best safeties in college football. I, I love Josh Proctor. I loved him when he came in. I was there that, that first couple freak, months he was man. there. Like, he's a freak. And he's a freak show. So I think he has a chance to be a great player, especially with how Knowles utilizes safeties in his in his scheme i think he has a chance to be an absolute star and then i think both of our corners i think cameron brown denzel burke are going to be absolute lockdown corners so there's a lot of hope in the back end the linebacker position is where you have all these question marks mm -hmm. and i don't think there's anyone that you could dub a potential star right now and then the super sophomore d-line right tyleek williams jtt just uh, they're going to have a breakout season they just are yeah it's interesting because like I, coaches do a great job of coach speak but sometimes the players will let slip who's been really dominating in practice. Oh, all the time. When they get interviews, they'll, they'll, they'll let it slip for sure. And the guy that I'm most <laughs> interested to see, because he was an incredible talent out of high school, and he's had some injuries here and there, but Teron Vincent, he, he just looks like, and it just feels like he's a kid that's going to explode this year. Adolphus Washington be, type? Absolutely. Absolutely. An interior guy that's athletic, powerful. I just think between Flex. him and Tyleek Williams, you're going to have two awesome three techniques. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited for things. I am interested, Zach. Do you think Knowles will be able to? I guess you talked about personnel match. I ask that all the time. Um, on the linebacker front, two or three are going to be on the field. How do you divvy up reps when you kind of gear up a competition? I mean, you, you, you try to give equal reps, and then, and then you slowly whittle down who needs what. Right? You mm -hmm. have a one, you have a two, right? And those two, those two kids need to get the same amount of reps, which is a shit ton. Because at any moment, that one could go down and the two becomes a one. So he has to get reps. The real art of coaching is how to get your threes reps. Because remember now, if that kid goes down, that three becomes a two. And now he, he might be in the rotation actually playing meaningful snaps. So you have to develop and coach them, not only for that scenario this year, but that you can't waste a year on a kid. 
If that kid's a three this year, you're hoping next year he's a two pushing to be a one. If you don't develop that three all fall, the likelihood that he's ready to be a two or one that next calendar year is low. So that is the art of coaching. You have to develop your young guys somehow, some way without jeopardizing those reps that you should be giving to your ones and twos. Urban Meyer, there's rumor he had the what the call to arms meeting every every fourth or fifth week. We talk about the young players. Do you, are were co all coaches a part of those, or did you guys go give the call to arms meeting to your players? Oh yeah, I mean he he did a great job, and Ryan's continued it of the you know a, after practice is done, right? Those threes that maybe got thirty percent as many reps as ones and twos, they'll stay out for fifteen minutes in scrimmage just to get more game reps, to get more reps, to get coached individually. The ones and twos head to the cold tub and go, you know do their post-practice routine and the threes are staying out there and they're going to get developed and they're going to get coached. And that's where you do it. That's where you, and that's where some kids start to pop and you're like, you know what? This kid's doing outstanding in our threes on threes. Let's roll him into the ones and twos a little bit. And that is how you develop depth and how you find a kid that, that is developing right in front of your eyes. Because if you don't do those segments after practice, those threes aren't getting enough reps to get better or to show you that they might be ready to play. With Justin Fry, I'm a little concerned because he's, you know, first year coach. He's got to do a lot of the reshuffling, get them ready. Additionally, like building building depth on the offensive line, in my opinion, is the most difficult thing to do um, to is. kind of keep chemistry. And additionally, the offensive line is the position that you always, unfortunately, see an injury on because it is such a violent area. If well, an offensive it's, it's, lineman goes down, do you have faith that the Justin Fry will get this thing tightened up and good to go? Yeah, I do. I do. I, just because I know him. But, but offensive line is so different, right? Receivers, it's easy. The kid plays X. So you put him out there at X and he learns the route tree. He learns what, who to block offensive line. They work in tandem so much, right? The right guard and right tackle do a lot of shit together. So there's a, a major chemistry there. And when the right guard goes down and a new guy goes in, like how many reps have those two had together? And that's why sometimes when you see a tackle, all of a sudden start struggling or a guard, all of a sudden start struggling. It's like, all right, look at the big picture. Does he have a new right tackle next to him? Like, because they you can hang you can hang each other right. out to dry. When you exactly. pass pro, there you have a gap, but you're you need to help other linemen with hands and punching because you it's hard to block a guy one-on-one. -on -one. So offensive line is by far the hardest position to develop that because those kids need time and reps together. And so when a kid goes down, it can't be the first time that Paris Johnson's working with a new right guard. Right. That had to have happened at some point through training camp. So they have a little bit of a history together. Zach, I want to move on to the recruiting trail before we get out of here. Um, man, Ohio State seems to be getting dunked on for all these defensive recruits. And it's okay. Like, the, the Bama thing, the Caleb Down thing, it's not over. Um, they're, they're still pushing. I know Will Fong put the uh, put Will the crystal Fong ball seems for to Bama. be like the guy that, like, ends everyone's life. Yeah, <laughs> like, like literally a lot of panic buttons. But this one I thought you'd think would be interesting. There's a kid, defensive tackle, down in Florida, John Walker. Um, considered a Buckeye lean at some point. Will <laughs> Fong today – Put the crystal ball. We've been battling UCF, Zach, for the kid. Yeah. Well, he's an Zach. Osceola kid, right, mm -hmm. which is Central Florida. And that just the, his mom wants him to stay close to home and thinks he can be like a hometown hero in Orlando. And that happens. It's it's honestly when I – when and I don't know that I ever lost a kid to like a UCF, but there's times where kids just – they that's just what they want to do. They want to stay close to home. They want to be a big fish in a small pond. And – there's not much you could do with that kid because he obviously doesn't have that highly, highly competitive nature where he wants to win national championships. And ultimately that's probably a kid that you don't want, no matter how talented he is. So, and that's not to shit on the kid, right? That's not the sour grapes of don't get him. That's a great job by UCF and the kid wants to go there. So it, it just is what it is. It happens in recruiting kids value certain things over other things. And if the value is not, you know, national championships playing on that big stage, developing in the NFL and it's more like I want to play college football get my school paid for I could still go to the NFL UCF guys have gone to the NFL and I could play in my hometown close to my family and friends and be this great player for a smaller school it, it does feel like day though is kind of missed out on kind of recruiting the parents as well this feels like a case where the mom did not get recruited as hard and because of that maybe there was a non-committable offer at some point and they wanted to prove it and now the mom is very vocal with, with driving that, that kid to UCF. How often do you see kids overrule their parents? I, mean, I know B. John Robinson at one point was a commit to your guy, Tony. There's a video done and all that. And then he ended up at Texas. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it, 
it just every dynamic is different. And as a as a coach that's recruiting a kid, you mm-hmm. have to figure out that dynamic, right? Like Johnny Dixon, his mom certainly wanted him to go to Miami. He, he would be closer to home, but right, she wasn't exactly. going to force him to. So he didn't go against her wishes and go to Ohio State. She just kind of left it up to him. And that was a mom that wasn't as involved in that decision because she trusted him to go where it was best. And she wasn't going to get let him go somewhere awful, right? But in her heart, she wanted him to go to Miami. It's right down the road. She could see him way more often. She could see every game. But when he decided to go to Ohio State, she understood and she got it and she was good with it. So it's rare that parents are adamantly fighting their kids on going somewhere and that kid still goes. But mm-hmm. there are several uh, you know, situations where the parent may not have that much pull in the, in the decision. And you have to figure that out as a recruiter so you know who to push. Yeah, I've heard that he wants to come to Ohio State. He loves LJ. That's his best relationship. But he is worried about his mom. His mom wants him to be a UCF. She wants to see him play. Um, are <laughs> are there more mama's boys in the South? He's like a big, a, a big, big kid, 6'3", 3'10", 315. Hey, man. I mean, that's, I'm a mama's moms boy, are, so I get those, it. Yeah, exactly. Those, those Southern moms are different, man. They, they, mm-hmm. they, all, almost every kid was a mama's boy that I recruited. And there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's also just unfortunately because of just the way the, the way society great. has has become and developed. There's a lot of kids, especially in the South, that that are in a one parent home and they only have mom. So mom is everything, right? Yeah. And that's it's awful, but it is it's just the state of of the, the region. Yeah, and, and I grew up with a single mom, and I I was never a big time college recruit, but I know that I would have my, my mom would definitely have kind of second or third choice, like. Whatever yeah. she said would definitely weigh really, really heavy. The the difference is I'm from Ohio. So, like, if I was ever a big-time recruit, I'm going to go to Ohio State. Um, yeah. and, and that would be the only thing against my mom's wishes because she went to Michigan. But other <laughs> than that, if there were, like, like a bunch of group of five schools, like, I would absolutely kind of listen to my mom and let my mom take the front seat because, you know, you want to go where she's comfortable. That's yeah. – and, and it's hard for a kid, 17, 18 years old, like senior high school, you go home to them every day. The one thing you don't want to do is ever disappoint your parents. Yep. So I, I am watching that closely. It is going to it is gonna cause an Ohio State meltdown, Zach. Like if, if UCF well, they, dunks it, on or stuffs it, LJ It sure seems or, like Ohio State's struggling in defensive recruiting, so that's something that needs to turn at some point. And I think, you know, it, it's tough for the new staff to get it done in one year. Recruiting has moved so early that these a lot of these kids have been building relationships with, with coaches and places for three years, mm-hmm. right? And so to lose a kid to USC, problematic, right? They just got there. Jim Knowles just got here. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't, and I don't know the backstory in that certain specific scenario, but Lincoln Riley was at Oklahoma. He was probably recruiting that kid then, right? Yeah. Whereas Jim Knowles was at Oklahoma State. He's not recruiting the same kid that Ohio State is recruiting. So I wouldn't panic yet. I think a great year on the field will help them with momentum. And I think next year's class is where you have to evaluate. All right, where are we at? They had two years to recruit this class. Are they getting big time kids or are they swinging and missing again? And if they are, it's panic mode. Hit that panic button. Sirens need to go off. You got to blow it up and and figure out how to how to get it right. Right now, Ohio State is not doing a good job closing. And, And, you know, I know media likes to give them passes, but Ryan Day and Jim Knowles, have to do a better job closing on defensive prospects and the assistant coaches as well. Like you have to do a better job closing. There's no excuses for that. Nope. My one thing is I will say is Knowles has never been a recruiter. You and I already knew that. Ryan, they already knew that. We know that at some point, instead of selling a dream, they're going to be able to sell the product on the field, you hope. So I'm going to hit the panic <laughs> button if the defense goes up there and looks iffy because then you have an Oklahoma State you know, guy and the product isn't as good as you want. And he's making $2 million a year. And you don't have a product to sell to these recruits. Because right now, it's just dreams and NIL stuff. But at the end of the day, guys... We talked about it on a show last week, right? We talked about it last week that Jim Knowles was brought in to fix the defense, right? To put a great product on the field. And I I get it. As the CEO of the defense, your job is also to make sure recruiting your staff and you are recruiting at a high level. Mm -hmm. But he was not brought in because we sucked in recruiting defensive players. He was brought in to fix the defense. So if he does that, the onus has to fall on Ryan day and the assistant coaches. And then Jim Knowles needs to get better. Mm -hmm. But like you said, major red flags, if they can't recruit and the defense doesn't look better this fall. Exactly. Cause the the cupboards are full, Zach. Like, like even people talk about our our linebacker room. We have four and four, five stars in locker room. Like we have freaks everywhere. Like on the, on the DB side, Coombs made sure that everything was stocked up very nicely. Like we have players at every level. So there should be no excuse. I don't want to, you know, I know at Oklahoma state, it took two years for him to get it right this year. He's got one year. In fact, he's got two or three months to get it right. So we can start landing these kids. And then I will be very concerned, but 
I believe the defense will be good. So I'm not too stressed about that. Zach, ESPN did it. They dropped our guy, Arch Manning, to the number two quarterback um, in the country, number two player in the country. So football Jesus has died. He's no longer Mr. 1.0, meaning he's nowhere near the player Quinn Ewers is. Are you surprised? <laughs> nowhere near. Yeah, because that's all that matters is the, the 1.0 behind his name. Yeah, I, mean, I was actually surprised to see they did it. But again, I think it, it, it's that time of year where the clicks went crazy, right? They dropped him, nice. and they got all kinds of clicks. And I One think it was deserved. <laughs> that's just and that that let's make sure this is clear, right? It's because out of sight, out of mind. This kid's not doing camps. He's not going to the Elite Eleven. He's not doing any of these things. So these these services have their eyes on these really talented players, and they they just see them more, right? It's like a long distance girlfriend. You're like, yeah, I love her, but look at this chick right in front of me. She's beautiful. She's smart. It's like your girlfriend may be more pretty, <laughs> but she's 600 miles away, right? Or whatever it is, 200 miles away. So, I mean, I, I'm not surprised they did it. And it's not the end all be all for him. He still could be the best quarterback that ever played. But I think it's, I think it was the right thing to do because the other kids are out there competing for that number one spot. And he just chose not to, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But he's just not going to have that you know, title anymore, I guess. One, 1.0. It is funny. It's like ESPN, will you give us in depth the stories about Tennessee cheating? Nah, but you know what? We will give you Arch Manning, number two quarterback, same right. day. <laughs> We're going to add insult to injury. Mm -hmm. Peyton and your family, Tennessee people, we're going to drop your nephew to number two. <laughs> we're still going to get the clicks. We're not doing the Tennessee stuff, but we're going to get those clicks. Zach, I got nothing else for today, man. Um, but I do want to say we are super excited about the, the stuff we're going to be doing. We're going to start to vamp up the coverage um, and vamp up the content, as well as we are looking to go earlier at 12 o'clock. And you can spend your whole lunch hour with us because we are going to be doing longer shows. And then we have some other stuff that you should be out on the lookout for um, on Patreon, on Twitter. And our TikTok is on the road to 20,000 followers, not subscribers. Um, but, Zach, thank you. You got anything else? No, I, I did want to mention just, just prayers to John Mechie as, as that news yep, broke over the weekend that he is battling leukemia and won't play this year. Um, don't know the kid at all. Seems like a good kid, but whether he is or isn't doesn't matter. I mean, you hate for anyone to go through that. So just sending prayers to John Mechie. Hope he gets a full recovery, and hopefully we can watch him play football again because I know that's what he loves to do. Um, so I wanted to do that. Also, as Chris said, a bunch going on with our platform. Over the next month, you're going to see it's going to be an explosion of content, additional content. Our Patreon link is not only in the bio, but right there on screen. If you want to get a part of the VIP experience, come hang out. We just had two people added to our Menace group chat. I haven't added them yet, but I just got their cell numbers to add them to that. So if you want to be a part of that, come hang out. And uh, we're, oh, in our squares, our first square board starts in August. I'm going to start selling square, the square fundraiser for the Notre Dame game. $100 a square, Venmo, Cameron Media. The I think the payouts are $3,000 for the final score, $1,000 for halftime, $500 for each quarter. So a chance to win three grand on 100 bucks and also raise money. So that will, all those details will be out here in the next week or two. So we're excited, man, and appreciate everybody. Menace out. Menace out.